President Aliyev, thank you very much for having us here. This region has been the stage of some of the most violent episodes in the South Caucasus' recent history. And the tensions haven't really gone away completely since the 2020 peace deal. To what do you attribute this constant hostility? Difficult to say. I thought that after the Second Karabakh War, uh, situation will be different. Um, and we were ready for peace. And actually waiting for a while for uh, international players to give us some new suggestions. We understood that it's a kind of a vacuum. Nobody knows what to do. And the situation when we had the declaration signed on the 10th November 2020 was not uh, actually providing a sustainable peace. It was not a peace treaty. Mm. It was a declaration. Actually, de facto, that was a capitulation act by Armenia. Uh, therefore, we started to um, put forward some initiatives in order to find the final solution to our conflict with Armenia. Mm. Uh, we made it public. We announced that we need to sign a peace agreement. And then again, it was a vacuum. Uh, so then we elaborated the principles for peace agreement, which are well, well known principles of international law, like mutual recognition of territorial integrity, sovereignty, international borders, uh, delimitation of borders, non use of force or threat of force. And we put that proposal on the table. So we, um, the country which suffered uh, 30 years of occupation and which uh, restored justice by force, we were the authors of new peace process. I would not say it is um, going very smoothly. Uh, we're still optimistic because we are now engaged in uh, very active negotiations on the level of foreign ministers of both countries. And I was going to ask you about that. You, you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you've just returned from Brussels from yes. another round yes. of peace talks. These peace talks have been filling many people with hope of lasting peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Are we right to be hopeful? What came out of this latest round? Yeah, I think it is the um, right thing to be hopeful, but I can tell you that peace uh, negotiations have been held by foreign ministers. Our meetings in Brussels, uh, organized by President of uh, European Council, these meetings actually allow us to uh, touch upon very sensitive issues, For to, example. like future parameters of the boundaries, yeah. because the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan has not been defined, because as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, we faced this aggression. So how the border will look like? Mm. What will be the uh, real situation on the ground? What will be uh, situation with uh, communications because uh, Armenia has obligation, which is signed as a result of the Second Karabakh War, to allow us access to our uh, exclave uh, Nakhchivan, but still it is not happening. So main uh, concentration on uh, paragraphs of peace treaty are made by the ministers. Our meetings, they just create, I think, a good atmosphere. But uh, if we see a constructive approach from Armenian side. And most important, if they totally put down all their aspirations to contest our territorial integrity, then we can find the peace solution very soon, maybe even by the end of the year. Wow. We'll, we'll get more into the negotiations later, but I'm curious to ask you, there's been many international players attempting to mediate this situation. What does the EU bring to the table, to the negotiating table? Actually, EU was not part of the mediation process during the times of occupation when we had negotiations since 1992. Mm -hmm. It was an initiative um, of President of European Council, Charles Michel, who um, invited us and we supported that because we think that uh, taking into account the level of cooperation between Azerbaijan and EU and Armenia and EU, I think it's natural for EU to be active, especially when after the Second Karabakh War, uh, Minsk Group was no longer functional. Actually, it is not functioning any longer. So there should have been some international institution 
And I thought that the EU can be the best because uh, our relations with the EU are based on uh, mutual respect and uh, mutual trust and mutual interest. So this initiative now is transforming into a very active format of dialogue because we meet not only in Brussels, we also meet, for instance, at the sidelines of the European Peace Initiative format. Last time it was in Chisinau. Uh, and I think it's important because uh, we do not allow situation to stagnate. Because if there is stagnation, if it's again kind of a break, then uh, we are not guaranteed from any dangerous scenario. And do you think that the growing mediation of the West, the EU, but also the United States, has somewhat antagonized um, a more traditional uh, power broker here in the region, Russia, or the other way around, the fact that Russia has somewhat been bogged down in Ukraine has left some space for potentially Azerbaijan and Armenia to come to common ground. Well, actually, uh, Russia was a mediator um, uh, of uh, ceasefire agreement or declaration of 10 November 2020. And it was not um, United States, it was not uh, EU. And our first uh, meetings with my Armenian colleague were organized by, by Russia, in Russia. So after Russian-Ukrainian war, situation has changed. And uh, we started to see that the United States and Europe became more active. And actually for us, it's not actually a um, big difference who will lead the process or who will, to a certain degree, monopolize the negotiation process. Important is to come to a result. Mm -hmm. Whichever actor can produce uh, initiatives that will lead to peace agreement, we will support it. And by the way, negotiations between our foreign ministers were held in uh, Washington. Now we got uh, invitation from Russia to hold a round of negotiations in Russia uh, later this month and we agreed. So if there'll be some other uh, location, of course, we will agree because it's important for us to come to an agreement and to have a result of course, understanding the certain geopolitical rivalries, mm -hmm. some uh, attempts of some players to be more active, mm -hmm. but we can only appreciate that. If there's a healthy rivalry, it will lead only to good results. What would you say, because I understand you have a long historical and complex relationship with Russia, how would you say is the Russia influence in the region at the moment? Well, it's difficult for me to say about the region because the region of Southern Caucasus consists of three countries and um, we can only observe uh, the Russia's uh, interaction with our neighbors in the Southern Caucasus. But as far as uh, Azerbaijan is concerned, not many things have changed because our relations with Russia were already balanced. They were based on um, recognition of each other's national interests and, of course, uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty. Russia is a neighbor to Azerbaijan and a partner. We have a, quite a substantial trade turnover, a lot of projects related to transportation infrastructure, especially now at this moment, uh, projects related to energy development and cultural, of course, segment you, is very you important. Have been striking more deals, in, especially with, with regards to the energy sector, no. with the West now, no? Yeah, with the West, yeah, but that was a um, long time ago when we launched the initiative to build the integrated pipeline system from Baku to Italy. Uh, it started to be implemented in stages and the final stage was implemented something more than two years ago. So it's already for something more than two years Azerbaijan became a, an important uh, gas supplier to Europe. And of course, uh, situation with sanctions on Russia created a new dimension because our energy resources now are needed more than before. But whatever we do, we do it based on the plans and contracts which have been signed many years ago. 
It is true that now we have more countries who are applying for additional gas from Azerbaijan and we're ready to do it and we already started. Mm. Um, more countries started to get our gas already last year and this year it will continue. But uh, again, it's um, from point of view of our relations with Russia, not many things have changed mm. since Russian-Ukrainian war started. Haven't changed. Um, can we talk about the situation here on the ground? Because the International uh, Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the US, the EU have all demanded guarantees with regards to the freedom of movement in the Latin corridor nearby, citing the danger of effectively potentially holding a population under siege if that corridor is blocked. Um, what do you know of what's happening in Latin in the corridor right now? Well, um, actually, for, uh, for more than two years since the Second Karabakh War ended, uh, the so-called Lachin Corridor functioned as it functioned during the times of mm -hmm. occupation with one uh, difference. It was under control of the Russian peacekeepers, mm -hmm. which was part of the trilateral declaration. And um, there was no disruption and there was no uh, steps from our side to interfere. Uh, in the meantime, situation on the ground was changing. And uh, the reason why representatives of civil society of Azerbaijan uh, to a certain degree started to control the corridor oh. was because uh, of the fact that illegal excavation of uh, natural resources uh, in Karabakh restarted in the beginning of uh, November last year. Because after the war, it was stopped because it is illegal. Mm -hmm. These resources belong to us. And uh, several foreign companies were illegally exploiting our gold and uh, copper mines. We could not do anything about that during the times of occupation, but when the war ended, it was obvious that this activity should have stopped and it stopped. But then in November, it restarted. Uh, representative of civil society uh, asked Russian peacekeepers to allow them to conduct a monitoring on the mines to see what is happening. And uh, because we've seen that uh, iron ore and golden ore was being transported by trucks from Karabakh to Armenia, accompanied uh, by Russian peacekeepers. So we were denied uh, the right for access. And that is how our uh, civil society representative started to control it. But again, the road was not closed. It was absolutely free and the movement was free. So it was never interrupted? Traffic was never interrupted? No, no. So why do you think these institutions have asked, especially on the part of Azerbaijan, because they said, you are responsible for the area surrounding it, so you should ensure the freedom of movement. Why do you think that is? Are they targeting you just because of... International Court of Justice actually um, addressed its message to us to communicate with uh, civil society activists, uh, not to disrupt any kind of movement, and we did it. And uh, as soon as we establish the border checkpoint on our border with Armenia, which is our legitimate right, which is not contested by anyone, including International Court of Justice, uh, we communicated through my uh, representative here in Shusha with um, NGOs representatives for them to, to stop. And they stopped, they left. Mm. So now freedom of movement is not blocked. Since we established the border checkpoint on the 23rd of April, there have been more than 2,000 uh, residents of Karabakh who easily moved to Armenia and back. On 15th of June, uh, Armenia uh, made an, another military provocation and wounded one of our border security guards. And uh, temporarily the road was closed for investigation. But then it was reopened. Uh, Red Cross uh, restarted again to transport medications and uh, evacuate patients who need treatment in Armenia. But unfortunately, uh, Red Cross um, trucks, when checked, 
uh, we found uh, smuggling goods like cigarettes, iPhones and gasoline. Red Cross admitted that and they communicated with us saying that they do not bear any responsibility because the these trucks people, were being used yes, by But drivers. these trucks had their badge, logos, logos mm -hmm. and the drivers had their logos mm -hmm. on their uniform. So, uh, so that's how again it was blocked and we asked from Red Cross to stop it and also asked them to work with us uh, more constructively because unfortunately until today the office in Karabakh is subordinated not to Baku office but to Yerevan office and this is not acceptable because uh, the whole world recognizes Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. Even Armenian Prime Minister said many times that Karabakh is Azerbaijan and why Red Cross uh, Han Kendi office is not subordinate to Baku office, but to Yerevan office. That's our legitimate request. Would you say that this issue, the issue of Lachin corridor and that border control and, and this passageway, this crucial passageway, is one of the main obstacles for peace right now? Well, I don't think so, because the um, situation uh, on the road Lachin Han Kendi changed on the ground uh, on 23rd of April when we established the border checkpoint. Until that time, we had two and a half years of time to come to peace agreement. The only stumbling block was that Armenia didn't want to recognize Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan officially. They, yes, they did it. Uh, by statements, by oral statements, which is also a position, but they need to sign under the document. Uh, so I don't think that these two issues are interrelated because uh, I hope that um, peace negotiations with Armenia uh, will uh, end with with successful scenario and hopefully in the coming months. I believe you've already answered the question I'm going to ask you now, but I'm going to ask you anyway because you're here and I won't get a chance of asking mm -hmm. many times. Um, some 5,000 people lost their lives in, in 2020 in both sides. Um, I was here, I came to Nagorno-Karabakh and I met many uh, mothers of fallen Armenian soldiers. I've also witnessed the pain and the devastation on the other side, on your side through the work of my colleagues here in Azerbaijan. But I remember speaking to one mother in particular who told me she blamed politicians for the war and for the death of her son, saying that politicians should deal with things in a diplomatic way and not fall into the trap of a war. What would you say your mission is? Is it to win a war or to bring lasting peace? Well, to win the war was the mission uh, of my life, of my political life, which ended successfully. So we won the war despite many factors, uh, political, despite uh, factors of uh, long lasting infrastructure projects on the occupied territories, which uh, made it very difficult for our military servicemen to break uh, several defense lines. They had in some parts five, in some parts seven, defense lines full of mines. Mm -hmm. And also you've noticed coming from Fizuli that the road climbs up. Mm -hmm. So that's how our, our military servicemen came here. Mm -hmm. The road which we came, the Victory Road, as I called it later, did not exist. Mm -hmm. It was a road how our military servicemen were moving towards Shusha. They were climbing these uh, rocky mountains. Uh, so despite these factors, despite uh, strong political support from um, many countries which uh, have big Armenian diaspora, we uh, did what was right to do. We restored justice and uh, we restored our territorial integrity. We fought on our land. We didn't fight on Armenian land and uh, we won. So that was a mission number one which is over. And now we talk about peace and for a country which suffered 30 years of occupation because the territory uh, which was under occupation is totally ruined. Shusha was not totally ruined because there were illegal settlements in Shusha. They wanted to 
resettle Armenians from Middle East, and there have been a couple of thousand uh, Armenians living here. That's why not all the cities have been destroyed. But Fizuli totally leveled to ground, mm -hmm. Agdam the same. Um, almost a million Azerbaijanis were deprived from uh, their homes. So uh, despite all that pain, we uh, did not uh, take revenge. Mm -hmm. I said we will take revenge on the battlefield, but as soon as Armenia gave us dates when they will withdraw from all the territories, which I demanded from the first day of the war, we stopped. And then we started to talk about peace. So now peace is on our agenda. If Armenia wants peace, we will reach it because we do not have any territorial claims to Armenia and we don't want them to have any territorial claims to Azerbaijan. Uh, people who live in Karabakh, in an area which is controlled now temporarily by Russian peacekeepers, they live in Azerbaijan and they should uh, choose whether to live as citizens of Azerbaijan, as ethnic minority, as any other ethnic minority, which Azerbaijan is rich of, or to leave. So this is their choice. It's not because we want them to leave, or as Armenia accuses us, we organize ethnic cleansing. No, we give them a choice because how can they live on our territory being a citizen of uh, either Armenia without any legal permission or a citizen of so-called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, which is not recognized by anyone. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a legitimate approach. It is in line with international practice. It's in line with the practice which we see in many European countries, which also fight against separatism. Mm -hmm. And now we see how uh, Europe and the West is united to help uh, Ukraine to fight against separatism. Mm. And why in our case, our fight against separatism is treated differently. Mm. Why uh, Georgia's approach to separatist regions is fully understood by Western communities and politicians and our legitimate, the same origin desire to put an end to separatism is uh, under question. Why Spain do not allow Catalonia to have a referendum, those are five or six millions, wow. and they don't have their own state, unlike Armenians, which have their state next door. And why should we tolerate separatism? And we, we will not. You have already issued messages as well of uh, reassurance towards the population that state, saying that they will be allowed to stay if they want to, yes. and, and protected and, yes. and um, allowed to live here. Uh, but do you have a message today to Armenians who may be watching us, not necessarily the government, I know you are in touch with Prime Minister Pashinyan, you don't necessarily need our cameras to send him a message, but what about to other Armenians who may be watching us? Uh, what, is, what is your message to the other side today? Well, I never thought about that because uh, that's the first time in my life I'm asked this question. Really? Yes. Uh, I think I would... Um, separate the question in two. Mm -hmm. First, uh, if, uh, if they listen to what I say, a uh, message to Armenians in Armenia mm -hmm. that uh, we um, want to have peace with the state. Uh, we don't have territorial claims to Armenia, though uh, hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijanis lived in Armenia uh, before the war and were totally ethnically cleansed and their cultural and religious heritage was totally destroyed. Uh, nevertheless, we don't have any territorial claims, but we think that uh, Azerbaijanis who have been deported forcefully from Armenia have a right to return uh, when Azerbaijan and Armenia will uh, normalize their relations and establish diplomatic relations. Uh, another message to them is to clearly realize the current geopolitical situation and the balance of forces. For many years, leaders of Armenia were persuading their people that they have the strongest army in the world, mm -hmm. that if the war starts, they will come to Baku, 
that Azerbaijan will not fight for its lands, that Azerbaijan has already agreed for occupation. All these narratives which were absolutely false and uh, was nothing more than propaganda. So the war destroyed that narratives and not only that, it also destroyed uh, a lot of uh, ideological, uh, I would say, columns of uh, Armenian state they realized that they lost the war and the, most probably it was very painful for them psychologically. Mm. Uh, so now when we say that we want peace, it's not because uh, we are weak and we are seeking for peace. No, they know that we are much stronger. Uh, it's because we want this um, black page of our history to be turned down. We don't want another war, neither today nor ever in the future. So um, for Armenian community, I think they should not oppose peace initiatives of international community and should understand that if they don't uh, sign peace agreement with Azerbaijan, situation in the future will be unpredictable and the geopolitical situation in the world and in the region changing, as we see, very dramatically. And um, part of their hopes for their security vanished completely. Uh, now they're looking for new security guarantors. Mm -hmm. And who is ready to have a standoff with Azerbaijan on the battlefield in this area, uh, especially after what we demonstrated during the war and after we increased our defense uh, capability after the war. Is there anyone ready to fight for Armenians against us? I doubt it. So, uh, and also another message, which I already conveyed to Armenian government, in this particular situation, for them the choice is not the best and the very best. For them the choice is among very bad and acceptable, but acceptable based on common sense, on international law and on uh, recognizing the rights of Azerbaijanis to live on their own land, which they deprived us for 30 years. And for Armenians um, in Karabakh, I'd like to remind them that we started uh, contacts with them spontaneously. Uh, actually, it was um, mainly people-to-people -people contact when we started to build a new Lachin road, mm -hmm. uh, which passed through several villages where Armenian population lived. And I was informed that the, the contacts have been established between our road construction workers and Armenian community, and immediately they have um, became almost friends. If in the first months of the construction, Russian peacekeepers were providing security for both sides. So then they just left and there was no Russian peacekeepers and they were easily communicating. So it demonstrates that um, ordinary people uh, in the majority, they don't have this hatred in their hearts. And for Armenians in Karabakh, they should not follow uh, their so-called leaders. These leaders were lying to them all the time, current and previous, before the war, during the war that they are winning. Even when we took control of Shusha, they were telling that Shusha is under their control. They know it very well. They should not become a hostage of uh, today's clique which captured power in Karabakh and whose um, main objective is to uh, provide their own interest. Here in Shusha, there are free villas uh, built during the times of occupation. And if you are interested, maybe they can uh, show it uh, to you. And these villas were built for the leaders oh. of uh, Karabakh Armenia. They built it for themselves. The city was totally in ruins. What you see now, it's a, it's a beginning of our reconstruction process, including this Karabakh Hotel, including the mayor's office, 
including hotels and uh, everything. They built free villas in the best part of the city for themselves. Those people who today lead this so-called uh, unrecognized republic. So Karabakh Armenians should understand that uh, being part of uh, Azerbaijan society with security guarantees, we understand it, with their rights, including educational, cultural, religious, uh, municipal rights, they will live normal life and they will also stop to be a hostage of uh, manipulation. And also they should understand that situation in which they are now today will not change in their favor if they continue to ignore us, if they continue to behave like uh, we uh, do not exist or they live uh, in so-called uh, country which uh, has president, ministers, parliamentarians, mm -hmm. This is all fake. We offer them normal life. And um, I think if they listen to me, they should uh, understand. And they know that I mean what I say. President Aliyev, thank you very much for speaking to your news. Thank you. Müsahibədən sonra Prezident İlham Əliyev Evranyusun müxbirinə işğal dövründə Şuşada ermənilər tərəfindən güllə baran edilmiş, Azərbaycanın tanınmış şəxsiyyətləri Nahtəvan, Bülbül və Üzeyr Hacıbəlinin heykəlləri barədə məlumat verdi.